Political Psychology Committee of the Iranian Political Science Association. On behalf of the Iranian Political Science Association and also the House for Social Science Scholars in Iran, I want to welcome you out to our event today. Our speaker, Professor Rothbart, as well as our audience in Iran and abroad, welcome. This is part of our lecture series on political psychology. Well, you know that in addition to the scholarly aspect regarding political psychology, we are delighted that our events help get the academic communities in the US and Iran closer despite differences and disagreements in political arenas at the leadership level. Today, Professor Rothbard from George Mason University will talk about power, violence, and emotions, the rise of political extremist groups. Please mark your calendar for our next event. On January 19th, Dr. Marta Cottam, the author of Introduction to Political Psychology, will talk about the analytical utility of combining image and social identity theories in the study of political behavior. As more people are joining us, I want to mention that most of our colleagues in Iran do not use Zoom. Some of them are installing it for our events, but this talk will also be recorded and posted on social media accounts of the host, as well as my YouTube channel. So I have a question for our audience now. Please go to chat and type where you are watching us from, which city or village, which country maybe, and now I'm going to switch to Farsi to introduce our today's speaker in Farsi. Salam be hamegi mukhataban aziz. Umidvaram ke halatun khub bashe va shabetun dar Iran be khair bashe. Az taraf komite ravanshanasi siyasi anjuman ulum siyasi Iran va khane andishmandan ulum insani be sokhanran azizamun aghay doktor Radbart va mukhatabin muhtaram khosh aamad migam. این دومین سخنرانی از مجموع سخنرانی های کمیته روانشناس سیاسی ایران کمیته روانشناس سیاسی انجمن علوم سیاسی ایران هم و در اولین سخنرانی با عنوان روانشناس روانشناسی سیاسی نیازها و ضرورت های ایران 1400 بنده و آقای دکتر علی اشرف نظری در مورد کاربرد روانشناسی سیاسی صحبت کردیم توی اون سخنرانی ما تلاش کردیم بحث مقدماتی در حوزه های معرفت شناختی، روز شناسی، اهمیت و کاربورت های عملی روانشناسی سیاسی رو ترک کنیم و با نشان دادن تصویر بزرگتر فضا رو برای سخنرانی های بعدی آماده کنیم. اگر اون سخنرانی رو ندیدید توصیه میکنم از طریق حساب کاروری انجامن علوم سیاسی در تلگرام اون رو ببینید. در سه سخنرانی بعدی در مورد هویت و نظریه تصویر، تاریخ و روانشناسی سیاسی و روایت و روانشناسی سیاسی صحبت خواهیم کرد. و همینطور در آینده نزدیک سخنرانانی در خصوص روانشناسی رهبران خواهیم داشت. سخنران بعدی ما خانم دکتر مارتکاتم نویسنده کتاب مقدمی بر روانشناسی سیاسی که در تاریخ 29 دیماه ساعت 7 بعد از ظهر به وقت ایران صحبت خواهند کرد. دوتا تقویم هاتون رو علامت بزنید که سخنرانی از دست ندید من میخواستم تغازایی کنم از حاضرین عزیز که لطفا الان به بخش چت برید و برای ما بنویسید که از چه منطقه برنامه ما رو تماشا میکنید این به ما کمک میکنه که اطلاعات بهتری در مورد مخاطبان به دست بیاریم که در طراحی برنامه های بعدی در واقع کمک کنند است اجازه بدید که سخنران امروز رو معرفی کنم خدمتون آقای پروفسور دانیل رادبارت استاد حل مناقشه در مرکز مطالعات صلح دانشگاه جورج میسن آمریکاست تخصص ایشون در حوزه های پیشگیری از خشونت گروهی مناقشه های قومی مقوله قدرت و تعارض اخلاق حل تعارض وضعیت غیر نظامیان در جنگ و روانشناسی و سیاست در مناقشه است او در حال حاضر یکی از مدیران برنامه پیشگیری از خشونت جمعی است ایشان همچنین مدیر آزمایشگاهی با عنوان تغییر ذهن به سوی صلح است. پروفسور رادبارت نوشته های متعددی داره که شامل بیش از پنجاه مقاله و فصل کتابه. ایشون نویسنده یا ویراستار ده کتاب بودند که عناوین جدیدترین هاش به این صورته. 
در سال 2019 ایشون کتاب سلطه دولت و سیاست روانی مناقشه رو منتشر کردن و در سال 2018 تغییر سیستمی در آمریکا مبارزه برای کرامت در نظام های مخرب رو چاپ کردن پروفسور رادبارت دکتراشون رو در رشته فلسفه از دانشگاه واشنگتن در سنت لوئیس گرفت و در دپارتمان فلسفه دانشگاه جورج میسن تدریس کرده ایشون همچنین پژوهشگر مهمان در کالج لینکر، دانشگاه آکسفورد، دانشگاه کیمبریج و کالج دارتمت بوده اگه سوالی دارید حین سخنرانی ایشون لطفا توی بخش چت سوالتون رو بنویسید که ما بتونیم در پایان سخنرانی سوال رو از ایشون بپرسیم من برای معرفی سخنران به زبان انگلیسی برمیگردم و بعد از ایشون دعوت میکنم که سخنرانیشون رو ایراد کنم So now I'm going to switch to English now it's my pleasure to introduce our today's guest Daniel Rothbard is professor of conflict analysis and resolution at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University in the United States of America. He specializes in prevention of mass violence, ethnic conflicts, power and conflict, the ethics of conflict resolution, civilians in war, and the psychopolitics of conflict. He currently serves as co-director of the program on prevention of mass violence. He is also the director of the laboratory entitled Transforming the Mind for Peace. Professor Rothbard's academic writings include more than 50 articles and chapters in scholarly journals and books. Among his 10 authored or edited books, his recent publications include the following books, State Domination and the Psychopolitics of Conflict in 2019, and Systemic Humiliation in America, Fighting for Dignity Within Systems of Degradation in 2018. Professor Rothbard received his PhD in philosophy from Washington University at St. Louis and taught in the Department of Philosophy at GMU. He also held positions as visit visiting research scholar at Lineker College, Oxford, Uni University of Cambridge, and Dartmouth College. After Dr. Rothbard's presentation, we'll have some time for questions. If you have questions, I encourage you to put them in chat. Okay, Dr. Rothbard, I'm going to turn the time over to you now, and I will be back with questions from our audience in a few minutes. But if it's possible, maybe because you are the host now, are there people who are waiting for us in the room? Because uh, you may be able to admit them. Now there are 16 people here, maybe. Yes, well, first of all, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Gaidi, uh, for this very kind invitation. It's really an honor to be participating in the um, Iranian Political Science uh, Society, Association, excuse me, in particular, the Political Psychology Committee, which um, I, I have great, um, I put great value in the political psych psychological perspective on understanding matters of war and peace. Um, about the um, Zoom, I see there are five people entered the waiting room and as I receive invitations to enter, I will just accept along the way. That's very simple. Perfect, thank you so, so much. So I, I have a question, can you make me co-host so I can admit them in the room when you're present? Yes, let me. No, see, I can make you host, yeah, but it does not allow the option of co-host. Right. So, and you were saying before that that would prevent, if I made you host, that would prevent the recording, right? Um, no, maybe that would prevent you from sharing your screen. Oh, the sharing screen, right. Yeah. So should we keep it this way or? So I can, I have your slides and I can share the screen if you want, or you can stay as host, but you might get a little bit distracted letting people in while you're talking. 
Okay, why don't you sh uh, show the um, show my slides, and I'll just ask you if you don't mind, just next slide, next slide. Sure. So, would you please make me host again? Right. Thank you. Okay, so I just made you host. Perfect, thank you so much. So I'm admitting more people in the room. Now we are 23. So here's the thing, your screen is still shared. All right, I will stop sharing. Okay. There we go. Yes. So should I go to the next slide? Okay, so we're ready? Okay. Yes, uh, you're ready. Yes, again, thank you very much. Um, and uh, it is, it's wonderful to participate in this important lecture series. Um, my uh, school for peace and conflict resolution centers on the study of protracted violent conflicts. And if, next slide, please. And with protracted violent conflicts, um, there are, of course, many ways to categorize protracted violent conflicts, and this one kind of um, taxonomy is to say that many of these conflicts are struggles over freedom um, or struggles over equality when, in particular, a um, uh, non-state group or an identity group feels that they are being mistreated, in particular by a state government. Um, there are struggles over dignity. Dignity is a very important uh, motivation uh, for the rebel groups that their dignity is being um, suppressed or denied. But so many conflicts are struggles over security. And these are struggles that not only security at the state level, which is obvious since national security is basically the reason, a reason for the existence of, of a state, but there are struggles over security by non-state actors. That is, many of the extremist groups, many of the so-called terrorist groups um, are basically fighting over the security of, quote, their people. That is, the people who they claim to be fighting for, who they're protecting. And struggles over security are basically struggles to defend a nation, a people, a way of life, or an existence. And um, this is very common where uh, many groups, many non-state actor groups, as it were, rebel groups, basically go through series of struggles over their security. There are literally dozens of such struggles in Africa currently underway. Next slide, please. Um, one category of these um, non-state actors are extremist hate groups. And as we all know that the, these kind of groups have just uh, grown in number and intensity in, uh, in Europe. There are many groups in Europe, in Belgium, in Italy, in Germany, and they have been fueled by this sense of of security threat, the perceived security threat that they see with, with immigrant groups, with um, marginalized groups, in some cases with racial groups. In the United States, for example, there's intense study of these so-called um, hate groups. Uh, there are currently 78 hate groups operating in the United States, and a hate group basically is a group that is committed to 
um, attacking or maligning an entire class, an entire group of people. Um, and the, the targeted groups are, are, are very many among these hate groups. It's not only racial minority groups, it is groups of many different ethnic ethnicities, obviously religious groups and so on. Next slide, please. Um, we've done a number of studies of these extremist hate groups at my, uh, at my school. And one theme that emerges quite clearly is that their activities are, uh, or these groups basically have a very shallow perspective on ideology, but they are acting under intense emotional um, uh, experiences that, that they are ideologically thin and emotionally thick. And what I mean by emotionally thick is that their perception of the so-called impure people, that is the so-called threatening groups, their perception of them is so distorted frequently, in some cases reflecting not just a falsity of information, but a kind of fabrication of uh, a, a kind of delusional um, fabrication of who these so-called enemy groups are and what they are doing. These perceptions are charged with emotional intensity, with disdain, with bitterness, with contempt, and in particular, with a sense of righteous rage. Next slide, please. Um, and righteous rage, I think, is, uh, is quite common among the experiences of these hate groups. That righteous rage, I mean, we all know what righteous rage is. Um, it is a, a sense of anger, a feeling of indignation, at a certain person or group, presumably based on the accusation that they committed an, an offense, an injustice, and so on. Righteous rage is inseparable from perceptions of injustice that are allegedly committed by um, some, some enemy, some adversary, or threatening group. Again, righteous rage is all about a security threat. So here we have very importantly, the intersection of cognition and emotion, that they're inseparable. Um, righteous rage, I think, is not only a superficial emotion, it's not superficial at all, and it's not limited to a few members of the hate groups. It is, in fact, a complexity of four distinct processes. It's a complexity of processes that are that have political meaning. And I will uh, talk about this now. Next slide, please. So what I mean by complexity is that righteous rage basically can be understood in terms of four distinct processes. Um, it can be understood as behavior, understood as moral rationale, which is number two on this figure. It's understood as a contagion force, and righteous rage can be understood in terms of neurological processes. Um, so just some information about that that I think is important for understanding these hate groups. Um, conscious behavior, it's obvious that righteous rage is manifested in terms of, of public performances. This is very important for understanding the, the political underpinnings of the hate groups. The political strategy of the hate group is to exhibit a public performance of rage. Now, in the United States, this is um, a very frequent experience. The rage of public radio figures, uh, the, the two names I mentioned, Alex Jones and the former uh, Rush, Rush Limbaugh, who, who passed away recently, that their expression of rage is part of their power. And as I said, many times their expressions are riddled with not just false information, but um, it reflects a kind of, of, of fabrication 
uh, delusion about the so-called enemy groups. Of course, former President Donald Trump was, exhibited righteous rage in many of his public performances. Um, this conscious behavior became quite um, uh, shocking to the world, in particular in the United States, when on January 6th uh, last year, a group, approximately um, 2,000 protesters, that is supporters of Donald Trump, attacked the United States Capitol. Their expressions of rage were quite manifested and um, it really showed the power that they had in their uh, work. Next slide, please. Um, and next slide, sorry, I'm, I'm, I went ahead. Yeah, so here we have a picture of some of the um, enraged uh, attackers of the US Capitol. Next slide, please. Um, and um, what we have here, many of their expressions were quite intense and quite um, uh, violent. Uh, through their their behavior, um, and this um, really shows the the as it were the manifestation of rage. A second way to understand rage is as a moral force, um, and we don't usually think of the word force and morality together. But I think it is quite common in these public performances. That is the their raging behavior is inseparable from their claim of moral insight. And the moral insight is of course the claim of injustice. In the case of the attackers of the US Capitol, they were trying to redress the claim of a, uh, a, a political injustice that was committed allegedly by the Democrats and supporters of President Biden that the enemy threats are um, need to be suppressed, uh, that the violence to suppress such enemy threats is good violence. It is morally uh, compulsory. And there's many kind of threats. The, the, these groups basically are driven by the power of threat narratives. I have a list of different categories of threat narratives, all of which intersect with this sense of, of moral insight that the extremist groups have allegedly. Next slide, please. Um, we did a study of one such extremist group, as I mentioned, called the Proud Boys. And the Proud Boys basically have targeted a very long list of so-called enemy groups. These groups are threats to the United States, um, there are political groups that they claim are threatening. There are racial groups. There are uh, groups that support um, equal rights for women. They are very much supporters of, the, of what they call Western chauvinism. That is, they are, define themselves in their earlier statements in 2016, they are defenders of Western chauvinism. And, and, and after 2016, they also targeted basically who they consider enemies of white people. And here's just one phrase, uh, one statement by a leader of the Proud Boys, I'm not afraid to speak out against the atrocities that whites and the people of European descent face not only here in this country, but in Western nations across the world. The war against whites, European and Western, and Western society is very real and it's time that we start talking about it. So here we see a typical statement of the moral justification uh, for their attack. Next slide, please. Um, the third way of understanding righteous rage is as a, con a, a contagious force. That is, uh, this emotion can spread it is repeated in public performances. Observers can, as it were, catch the rage that they witness when 
uh, through the observation of angry faces, speech pattern, um, verbal hostility, and so on. This is very common in that have been revealed in studies of righteous rage. Even the rhythm verbal uh, display that is through the voice can be, an, as it were, a psychological, social psychological inducement for mimicking rage. This was very common among supporters of uh, Donald Trump when he had his political rallies that his rage, as it were, functioned as a kind of contagion force. Next slide, please. And this is um, uh, uh, just one of, of thousands of pictures of the Proud Boys basically exhibiting their rage and sharing their rage among uh, fellow members of the Proud Boys. Next slide, please. A fourth way of understanding righteous rage is through the neurological processes that um, neuro neuroscientists have known for many years that the amygdala is the source, is activated when people experience intense anger, uh, righteous rage. And this basically is a, uh, a, a the neuropsychological uh, formation of, of rage. It reflects both the emotion and cognition. It is not limited to pure feeling alone. It really reflects a kind of uh, integration of the brain and the body and the experienced world. Um, so, all of this is to suggest something that, in my opinion, is really, next slide, please, um, is something very important. So I want to shift gears and, and change the kind of moral topic, as it were, reverse the moral political arrow of this conversation so far and ask, what does this information about righteous rage tell us about pro-social emotions. That is, can we learn from the study of righteous rage about how to foster, maybe even induce positive outgroup attitudes? Um, be, uh, and next slide, please. In other words, I wanna use this model as a kind of conceptual point of departure uh, for investigating pro-social interactions, pro-positive uh, outgroup attitudes. And I do think that this deeper understanding of rage offers a kind of experimental uh, direction. And I, I'm suggesting a kind of pre-experimental set of um, assumptions about how to move forward with po to promote positive outgroup attitudes. For example, lesson number one is something called, next slide, please. Lesson number one is something called the neuroplasticity of emotions. Now, the neuroplasticity basically means the capacity of the brain to change its neurostructures in ways that correspond to experience. So what that means is that the neurostructures um, are subject to change based on individuals' experiences, based on their perceptions, um, and based on their social circumstances that they experience. And this is not just unique, this is not unique to positive emotions, um, but it also is common with negative emotions. But an example, a stunning example of this, stunning in terms of the experimental findings, are the recent studies of the inducement of compassion. That is, uh, a number of neuroscientists have actually tested uh, subjects to sh and shown that 
compassion can actually be fostered through a process called compassion meditation. That is, in the experiment, the subjects basically would be exposed to images of people who were suffering, and it fostered among the participants this sense of feeling sorry, feeling badly for the people who they witnessed as suffering and fostering a hope that the suffering would be relieved. So their experience was basically um, uh, induced through uh, these observations. And that inducement basically also corresponded to neurological processes. That is, there are processes in the brain that correlated to the feeling of compassion that was artificially induced in the experiment. Next slide, please. Um, and compassion basically has been a subject of inquiry for a very long time. Um, only recently has this been applied to uh, the process of peace building. Compassion basically is a sensitivity to the pain or suffering of others and a deep desire to alleviate the suffering either through one's own action or through the actions of others. So um, in the experiment that I mentioned a minute ago, there are basically neural processes that are activated as a result of the, uh, of the experiment that I mentioned. Now in this diagram, the red spots that you see correspond to the activation of certain neural processes, activation from compassion. The blue spots basically correspond to the activation of empathy. It turns out from these experiments that empathy and compassion are distinct psychological processes and that they correspond to particular distinct areas in the brain. Now, um, empathy is not the same thing, not exactly the same thing as compassion. As I mentioned, compassion is a sense of sympathy for the suffering of others. Empathy is a sense of participating in the experiences of others. Typically, the experiences that are negative. So empathy is a sense of emotional or cognitive sharing of an experience of others. Now, what happens um, is, um, uh, uh, next slide, please. Sorry, I was speaking and I didn't realize the slide was, I, I delayed on re my request. Uh, just to repeat very briefly, the red spots in this diagram correspond to the locations in the brain that are activated when somebody experiences a sense of compassion. The blue spots correspond to the portions in the brain that are activated with empathy. Again, empathy is a experience of sharing in the experience of other people. So the, um, these are distinct experiences and they are just correspond to distinct locations in the brain. Next slide, please. Um, as a result of this, scientists have studied something called empathic distress. So empathic distress is the suffering um, that is shared by this, uh, is shared by, uh, with others. Sorry, let me say that again. Empathic distress is a sense of suffering of others that's shared. Um, and with that sense of shared suffering comes a, an intense negative emotion that in some cases can be overwhelming. 
Now, um, this is a very serious problem for professionals who are exposed routinely to um, the suffering of others. Obviously, doctors, nurses, humanitarian aid workers have, tend to have an elevated risk of experiencing empathic distress. And many of these professionals actually uh, need to focus carefully on their mental health in, in regard or as a result of this, um, this sense of negative emotion. Um, and as I mentioned, empathic distress or empathy in general does correspond to the activation of distinct um, methods in um, distinct portions of the brain. Next slide, please. Um, lesson number two is something called moral cognition. And moral cognition basically is a theory um, that's advanced uh, recently by some uh, neuropsychologists that emotions and cognitions are inseparable elements of moral sentiments. So it's very important that to understand that cognition and emotion is a complexity that um, is, is part of this. Um, lesson number three, next slide, please. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, lesson number three is something called moral contagions. That, that is that emotions can be contagious. People can catch the emotions of other people. That um, it, in some cases, emotional conta contagions can be positive. It may foster social bonding. Um, it solidifies a sense of group attachment. It satisfies a need for belonging. So moral contagion is a inseparable from the drive for solidifying in-group bonding but it also can be intensified by outgroup hatred as well, that the emotion of hatred, of disdain, of, as I mentioned, righteous rage can be um, uh, matched, it can be shared, it can be a, a, a very serious contagion. And the implication of this is that moral contagions are political, experiences. They have political implications because the contagion basically functions as an unconscious social psychological force for galvanizing the in-group faithful and for, um, for attacking the so-called out-group enemy. Again, the moral contagion of the Proud Boys that I mentioned a few minutes ago is both a political force of galvanizing in-group support, and it's also a political force of attacking um, an enemy. Um, and this contagion, and I don't have time to talk about this, but basically the contagion shows that the um, emotion of the individual experience is fluid in relation to group experience. Um, we tend to think of emotion as only a group experience, but clearly, uh, I'm sorry, I said that incorrectly. We tend to think of emotion as um, an individual experience, but clearly emotions can be shared. It, a group can experience, as it were, the same emotion. And that suggests that the relation between individual emotion and collective emotion is fluid, it's dynamic, it moves back and forth. And this was revealed in our study of the Proud Boys, that the emotion of their leader can be shared through emotional contagion uh, among the group members. Again, emotional contagion was clearly illustrated also in the public performances of former President Donald Trump. Um, so what does this tell us about the possibility of inducing, um, of inducing pro-social emotions? Uh, I think that this is worth exploring and the Laboratory for Peace that I am um, managing right now is doing just that. That is 
we are, next slide, please. We are, um, next slide, please. We are basically engaged in studying how compassion can be induced among conflict actors. And one pilot study, this is, this is preliminary work. We do not have definitive findings of this, but a pilot study uh, was done among 15 young people. Um, actually, that number is wrong. It's 23 young people who were participating in a conflict resolution program in Italy called Rondine. And the, the program fostered a compassion among these young people. These are young people who lived in conflict regions. They um, grew up with a sense of, of, of disdain for the so-called enemy group. And in their experience, the um, compassion was a shared value that was fostered. We did a study of this group and most of them did express a sense of compassion, not all of them. Um, next slide, please. And so what we are studying right now is how to enhance compassion skills. I see compassion as a skill, which can be nurtured, it can be activated, and it can be honed and um, applied to overcome mind blindness, to promote an understanding of others as complex human beings, to probe similarities between in-group and out-group, and to focus on a moral plane of life. Next slide, please. And um, related to this overall mission of compassion, we are currently engaged in three research projects. One is called Activating Curiosity, that is try to activate among conflict actors a sense of curiosity, a, a sympathetic understanding of the others. And project number two is how to promote sympathy um, about immigrants in the United States. Project number three is basically how can righteous rage among hate groups be minimized through perspective taking? So uh, these are projects in the works right now, and we hope to have some findings in the near future. And all of which is part of a, long, a large scale mission of peace building of conflict transformation. That is to um, promote pro-social sentiments, to habituate those sentiments in practices, that is to have them repeated as habituated practices, and ideally to transform intergroup relations. Um, next slide, please. Um, and uh, the goal again is to transform intergroup relations and to promote pro-social uh, attitudes about the other. And at this point, I will stop right now. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Rothbard. I really appreciate your amazing presentation. Thank you. Um, so, I want to speak to Farsi. Um, Salam, I'm Mokhtar Bina. Dr. Rothbard, توی بخش چت من نیست و ازشون بپرسم Thank you so much uh, Dr. Robert So because my research focuses on terrorist groups This is one of the questions I had during your presentation that how do you categorize them? Are terrorist groups like examples of hate groups or what's the relationship yeah. between them? And are the same dynamics is basically applying to them. Right, thank you for your question, important question. Um, well, as you know, there are, one taxonomy gave a total of 200 definitions of terrorist groups. So uh, it, you know, it depends, as you know, um, but 
if we think of terrorist groups in terms of extremist violence, uh, groups that are committed to violence, then the there is a direct correlation to hate groups because as I mentioned, the definition of hate group is a group that is uh, that targeted that targets another group for negative um, behavior or uh, or or emotion or attitudes. So the, the the terrorist groups that I'm aware of and the groups that we've studied, uh, I've done some studies in Africa. Yes, these terrorist groups, Boko Haram, um, uh, and and various offshoots subgroups of Al Qaeda. Uh, yes, these are hate groups. There's no question about it that they target certain other groups for violent behavior. Right, right. Okay, thank you so much. So now I'm going to uh, basically summarize your presentation in Farsi, in case our audience, maybe some of them might have uh, English language barriers. So I'm going to switch to Farsi for a few minutes and I'll get back to you soon. Um, mm-hmm. به زبان فارسی یه خلاصه یا مهمترین نکاتی که سخنرانی آقای پروفسور رادبارد داشت رو براتون بگم و اگر که سوالی دارید توی بخش چت میتونید سوالاتتون رو بپرسید ایشون در مورد چهار نوع مناقشه صحبت کردند مناقشه برای آزادی مناقشه برای برابری مناقشه برای کرامت انسانی و مناقشه برای امنیت و فرمودن که گروه های نفرت من حول این چهارمین مناقشه ساختار دارن یعنی در بوزه مناقشه برای همدیگر ایشون تعبیر جالبی استفاده کردن گفتن که گروه های نفرت پراکن از نظر ایدئولوژیکی لاغر هستن ولی از نظر حیجانی یا احساسی بسیار فربند و عموماً یک نکته مشترک که درشون وجود داره اینه که اونها ترس از دیگری دارن و دیگری رو به شکل انسانهای نجس یا ناپاک یا تعبیری که ایشون به کار برد ایمپیور معمولا میبینن یک انصار اصلی در واقع گروه های نفرت خشم اونهاست یا حیجان اونهاست و این خشم ترکیبی از عوامل هم احساسیه و هم عوامل شناختیه یعنی یک پروسه شناختی در ذهن فردی که عضو گروه های نفرت پراکن میشه علاوه بر حیجانش وجود داره اون بخش در واقع هیجانیش رو ایشون در موردش صحبت کردن و در مورد اون بخش شناختی هم صحبت کردن گفتن که نگرش منفی نسبت به دیگری که یکی از فاکتورهای مشترک گروه های نفرته عموما متشکل از چهار بخشه یک بخش رفتاری یکی دیگه بخشی که توجیهات اخلاقی اعضای این گروه هاست در مورد روند عصب شناختی که بخش سوم هست صحبت کردن و یه نکته که برای من جالب بود در مورد ظرفیت سرایت در این گروه ها صحبت کردن و از گروه پسران مغرور یا پراود بویز به عنوان یکی از گروه های نفرت در آمریکا اسم بردن که مسئول عمده حمله 6 ژانویه به کنگره آمریکا بودن و نمونه ای از در واقع جملات رهبر این گروه رو گفتن که تایید کننده نظری بود که داشتن در مورد توجیه اخلاقی که گروه های نفرت پراکن دارن اینه که دشمن تهدیدی برای ماست و در خصوص بخش عصب شناختیشون هم ایشون فرمودن که در هنگام خشم بیشتر بخش آمیگدلا توی مغز فعال میشه که متاثر از هم جنبه شناختی و هم جنبه هیجانی ایشون در مقابل گروه های نفرت در مورد یک روند معکوسی صحبت کردند که شامل نگرش مثبت به گروه های دیگری یا نسبت به دیگری میشه و گفتن که این نگرش مثبت هم شامل چهار بخش میشه بخش رفتاری بخش اخلاقی بحث عصب شناختی و امکان سرایت ایشون در مورد ظرفیت مغز برای تغییر ساختار عصبی به صورتی که متناسب با تجربیات جدید افراد باشه به عنوان یکی از راهکارهایی که ما میتونیم تغییر بدیم داینامیک یا پویایی هایی که درون گروه های نفرت وجود داره صحبت کردن و در مورد چگونگی بالا بردن احساسات مثبت نسبت به دیگری هم حرف زدن ایشون گفتن که مهربانی یا شفقت میتونه 
یاد گرفته بشه و از مراقبه شفقت به عنوان یکی از نظریه هایی که تو این حوزه هست به عنوان یک کار عملی هم نام بردن یا کامپشن مدیتیشن آی دکتر رادفارد در مورد همدردی و همدلی یا توانایی افراد برای درک دیگری هم صحبت کردن و در مورد نقاط عصب شناختی در مغز که مرتبط با توانایی های همدلی و همدردی هم نکاتی رو گفتن در مورد تئوری های مختلف شناخت اخلاقی هم ایشون صحبت کردن و درس هایی که ما از این تئوری های مختلف میگیریم مثلا اینکه احساسات مثبت و منفی قابل سرایت به دیگری هستند و اینکه سرایت احساسات ما میتونن تقویت کننده پیوندهای اجتماعی باشن و رسومی که ما داریم یا ریچوال هایی که داریم میتونه تقویت کننده این پیوندها یا سوشال باندز باشن ایشون گفتن که سرایت این احساسات میتونه حس تعلق به گروه رو تقویت کنه و نیاز افراد به تعلق رو هم برطرف کنه و در مورد آموزش شفقت و تکنیک های مختلف مرتبط با اون و آزمایش هایی که داره انجام میشه در خصوص آموزش شفقت هم صحبت کردن اگر که سوالی دارید من یادآوری کنم که تو بخش چت بنویسید و من میخواستم از برگردم به زبان انگلیسی و سوال دیگه از آقای رادبارد داشته باشم اوکی thank you so much for your patience professor rodbard so i have another question and it's about compassion meditation so how likely do you think it is that a member of a terrorist group or a hate group let's say a member of proud boys full of anger hatred full of fear from immigrants and from people with dark skin and black lives matter how likely is it that he or she or they join a group which is practicing compassion meditation is this practical <laughs> is it practical well this is such an important this is the hardest question that we're facing <laughs> it is, it is. <clears throat> um excuse me <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is this is our challenge, and uh, right now, basically, we are looking for participants who are, as it were, bystanders. Relatively speaking, bystanders. Maybe people, groups who are sympathetic politically, but not active violently. Um, That is our experiments, one experiment includes people in religious communities who are politically conservative, but who might be sympathetic to immigrants. Okay, so these people are not the violent extremists for the reason that you're saying, of course, you're absolutely right. It is extremely difficult for us to find, let's say, neo-Nazis It is extremely difficult for us to experiment on the Proud Boys for, for the reasons that you're saying. So we are basically looking right now to um, engage people who are politically conservative, who might be sympathetic to the Proud Boys, but who are not themselves activists in violence, who not, do not themselves exhibit this violent righteous rage per se and that these are part of part of our studies um, another group just very briefly is police officers it turns out that some police officers did participate in the january 6th attack but many of them were horrified by the attack so we have a research project which engages police officers to activate their curiosity about potential criminals. In other words, it is not exactly righteous rage that they have for the criminals, but they um, would benefit, we believe, by more pro-social attitudes, such as activating curiosity. So that's where we are right now. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, um, 
Rasul or maybe Dr. Musali has a question. I'm going to unmute you, Rasul, so we can ask your question. Please go ahead. I guess, thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to thank you and the, and the association uh, for uh, their excellent programs. Uh, and also uh, Professor Rothbard sharing his knowledge with us. Uh, I would like uh, him uh, to elaborate more on the uh, subject of the attack uh, of violent groups uh, uh, to White House. If uh, there has been any background for it, I mean, in, in the uh, past or, and how do you psychologically, I mean, explain it? And it would be possible to repeat that occasion and what are the, the psych psychological re reasons uh, for this uh, important violence? Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you for your important question. Um, there are many psychological factors here that um, are relevant to the attack. And my a short answer is that um, the psychological processes are, are, are the ones I mentioned. That is psychological, the behavior, underlying the behavior is a sense of their moral righteousness. Righteousness is, is, is a sense of being, of, of wisdom about a perceived injustice. This is both moralistic and psychological as it were, in the field of positive psychology. Another psychological factor is the contagion that, um, uh, which is shared. And then of course, I mentioned the neuro processes. But what's very important to your, uh, in addressing your question is history. That is the shared sense of righteous indignation by extremist groups. In the United States, there is a very strong sense of rural rage, rural, that is in the, what's called the heartland of the United States. There is a, a very rich history of extremist groups who are attack in particular, not only the central government in Washington DC, but also feel um, entitled to attack racial minorities, religious minority groups, uh, and they feel that this is very important. An example was, was Timothy McVeigh in 1993 with his bombing of a federal building in Oklahoma City in the United States that he felt that the central government was promoting a um, uh, oppression against, against white people um, the attacks, of course, in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. So there's many of these episodes that fuel the intensity of subsequent groups. And yet, and, and I know you didn't ask this question, there is also very importantly, a very strong reaction to any violent act. That is every violent act sorry, not every, many of the, of the highly publicized violent acts by extremist groups in the United States promote a, an intense uh, social psychological reaction against these groups. Charlottesville, for example, was a political disaster for the extremist groups uh, because of the intense reaction uh, to the, the violence, to the neo-Nazis who were protesting. Um, so that, thank you for your question. Thank you so much, Rasul, for your question. And we have a question from Dr. Nazari, my colleague at the University of Tehran. So the question is, can neuropolitics replace traditional methods and measurement techniques in political psychology for examining which theories plausible or not in analyzing political violence? Um, short answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there is not a, uh, uh, there's not a good reason to replace traditional, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by traditional methods, but um, I take it you are referring to um, many of the 
the theories that explain political violence. And those theories, as I say, are, are relevant depending on the, the social political circumstances, obviously. It, it's a case by case basis. And um, 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 uh, grievance, for example, grievance theory uh, is quite relevant to this relative deprivation. What's interesting, by the way, of, of the theory of relative deprivation is um, many minority groups, of course, have good reason to feel deprived, groups in the United States. And relative deprivation, for example, could explain the enormous surge in protests in 2020 over the killing of George Floyd. As you may know, there were over 7,000 acts of protest uh, against the killing of George Floyd in 2020 in the United States, 7,000. This was the largest mass movement um, uh, in the United States since the civil rights movement of the 1960s um, that happened in 2020. So this could be explained by their sense of, uh, as I say, relative deprivation and their, um, the, the theory of structural violence, uh, the injustice of, of racially racialized structural violence or systemic racism. So again, the neuropolitics or the neuroscience does not replace the old theories. Thank you so much. So speaking about relative deprivation and grievances, what do you think about the greed aspect? Yeah. Rational choice yeah. theory. Yeah, well, I, I think that the greed uh, theory of group greed is, is very relevant for some of the white supremacist groups. Um, the, uh, the sense of, of maintaining their supremacy uh, social political supremacy is a form of greed. Um, I know greed, the theory of greed is often defined in materialistic terms of, of wealth and so on, but it's also a sense of social political status and white supremacist groups. And in, in fact, the Proud Boys, as I mentioned, there they were galvanized in their earliest days in 2016 by a sense of Western chauvinism that that show that men are being targeted, and in particular white men, I should importantly add, are being targeted for um, in a, in a war. It's a war against white men, basically. This is a form of of uh, of maintaining their sense their need for supremacy. Thank you so much. So I want to unmute Dr. Uh, Seikzade, and we have a few more minutes, maybe five, six minutes. So uh, Professor Seikzade, I'm trying to unmute you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was really, really great, great, I mean, presentation. Thank you. I really liked it very much, very much. But I have an experience and I want to ask you whether it is right or not. Thanks to my, let's say, background in Iran as a professor for 28 years and then they pierced me because I criticized that, okay, the religious government is not okay and God doesn't need government at all. So they pierced me <laughs> and I'm teaching here. When I taught at the Sunni in Genesio, I see that white supremacist, and they didn't understand that we are also Aryan. And then I came back here at the college. Here in America, I see the instruction. This is the hypothesis. I don't know whether the, the let's say, instruction rather than education make people, make students at these colleges, all different colleges, a little bit, let's say, a problem, psychological nervousness. They don't understand, they don't have that cognition. They have a skill, but they don't have cognition. Since they don't have cognition, but they have this skill, so they become as, uh, this is my experience, let's say, as Fromm says that, then they become a little bit disturbed. 
So in a white supremism, I think that a part of it is due to this. Am I right or not? Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite get, I didn't quite understand um, the question. I mean, uh, can I just explain it more? Yeah, it's, please, it's, yes, please. At the college, we are into, okay, let's say somehow told or advised that you tell them one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Uh, uh, one, two, three, four, they call it instructor. They call us instructor. So instruction, okay. It is instruction rather than education. I see. In education, you participate the student in thinking. Ah, uh, oh yeah. So you give them compassion. While in instruction is from, okay, <laughs> above to down. And so the students are thinking themselves victim in class. No, oh. a part of the class, you see. That is okay, but my hypothesis. I, 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 I'm not, I, I don't, I just don't have this experience. I, it's, it's hard for me. You're, you're asking how, uh, uh, what is the psychological response to this form of instruction of being taught, as, as you said, one, two, three, in a rote way. Um, uh, I, I, I do think that all instruction would benefit by critical thinking. Critical thinking basically is something that uh, is in short supply in, in many countries, in many regions. And what I mean by critical thinking is to delve beneath the surface of a fact, to look at the underlying assumptions uh, of a, a hypothesis or a statement. Um, under, what I mean by underlying assumptions is the assumption about what is real, what is good, and what is just. When we use these terms in the field of peace building, we're looking for peace. What exactly is peace? Is it negative peace? Is it the cessation of violence? Or is it positive peace? Is it the promotion of justice? Um, which is, of course, a classic question. But uh, I, I, I greatly admire your question and the importance of it. And it suggests the need to teach students how to think reflectively. And this is something that many of the sciences, and I, and I have had more than a little experience with uh, engaging with scientists. Um, may I confess that my first profession was uh, philosophy of science. And I had wonderful experiences with uh, working with scientists, uh, chemists and physicists. And the, the best chemists and physicists, in my opinion, I, I'm not a chemist or physicist, but I was a philosopher. The best ones is to, were those who reflected on the meaning of knowledge, the, uh, even the purpose of knowledge. And I know purpose is a normative question. What is the purpose of knowledge? But reflecting on this and blending that in seamlessly um, it's not irrelevant to designing an experiment. Every experiment that's designed um, is operationalizes a lot of these underlying assumptions. It puts them into action. An experiment is an action and it operationalizes this. So to go back to your important question, I think we need to teach students how to think critically to reflect on not only their assumptions, but to recognize that their assumptions might be wrong and that the assumptions of professors are at least contentious. Um, that the, the assumptions, I want my students to question my assumptions and to say that maybe I'm wrong. And I think that a sense of humility uh, about the teaching of knowledge and truth, so-called truth and, and peace and justice, a sense of humility is really important to instill in, in, in students. 
Thank you so much, Professor Rothbard. We are uh, almost out of time. Thank you so much, Professor Said Sadeh, for the great making the distinction between instruction and education. It was interesting. Um, okay, so um, thank you so much, our dear guest, Professor Rothbard, for your amazing presentation and our audience in Iran and abroad. Uh, please join us on January 19th for our next um, uh, lecture. Professor Marta Cotton will present um, the combination of image theory and social identity theory in explaining political behavior. So have a great day, everybody, and goodbye. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. I'm, I, I hope to have continued experience somehow with with anyone who participated in this event. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.